my lighting style uh, is different than a lot of people's lighting styles these days in that I try to do things with one big soft light to one side and then have as much control over the shadow side of a subject as I possibly can. So for me, the meter goes on every shoot. And for me, the meter goes in every setup. Now, I'm mostly a portrait shooter. I love shooting people. And I take the show on the road and shoot people in all kinds of locations. And when you're out in a location, you abdicate some of the control that you would normally have in the studio. So it means that your technique has to be nailed down a bit better than, uh, than the person who works every day in the same space with the same lights. So what I'm trying to do on a typical uh, shoot with a corporate executive, a CEO like Michael Dell or something, is get in and out quickly, but get results that are repeatable uh, using the light that I like. So I'm coming in with a 72-inch umbrella or uh, Ellen Chrome Octobox, something like that, uh, with lots of layers of diffusion because I want that key light to be soft and wrap around. And then I want the edge of the shadow to be almost black. The other thing is that we still get a lot of requests from magazines and from ad agencies to shoot against whiteout backgrounds. But when we shoot a whiteout background, it's really important, especially if you're doing it in a smaller studio, that you not overlight the background so you don't get a lot of bounce coming back and wrapping around from behind somebody. So we use our meter pretty religiously to make sure that the ratio between our key light and the light that's hitting the background are relatively similar. Uh, the other place where I use a, a meter a lot, and it, it's not necessarily a style of lighting, but I love to shoot in the streets. I love to go to Paris or Rome or, or some cool place and walk around with a Leica M6 or a Leica M3 uh, or a Mamiya uh, rangefinder camera, and and take photographs on black and white film. And most people, uh, I think, don't understand that metering is probably even more important in a situation like that, because either in the studio or on the street, if you depend on the in-camera meters, you're going to be spending an enormous amount of time in Photoshop kind of getting those exposures to some sort of middle ground. Okay, when we photograph executives and we're using a big soft light with lots of layers of diffusion, we've found that it's vital to go in with a handheld incident meter and take a very accurate reading of the tonal values that you want uh, to establish in the photograph. So I whip out my Sekonic meter, and every time I go out with a new assistant, <laughs> my second assistant always rolls or my first assistant always rolls his eyes when he hears the standard question, which is, hey, you've got histograms in the camera. You know, you get to see it on the little window. Why are you bothering to meter? And the reality is that if you've got anything white in your image, like somebody's white shirt, some white in the background, uh, et cetera, and it pegs off the edge of the histogram, you have no idea where the established edge of the highlight tones in the person's face that you're going to be able to get. If I go in with a meter, and it's a well-calibrated and known meter, and I take a very specific reading from that person or, or at that person's subject uh, area uh, back toward camera, and I get a very specific f-stop, if I shoot the camera at that exact setting, when I get back to the studio, all the tones on either side are exactly where I want them. If I try to eyeball it and look at the little screen on the back of the camera, the existing room light, the reflectance off the back of the LCD monitor, the calibration of the camera, all those things come into play, and it gets sloppier and sloppier and sloppier. With any digital camera, you want to be able to nail the midtones and highlights exactly where you want them. If your safety plan is to underexpose so you don't blow the highlights, you're compressing your shadows. And that's when bad things like banding occurs and lack of detail in the shadows, which makes the, the file look pretty grungy.
which may be something people like. I don't know. The other reason that I use meters a lot in situations like that is that I'm not 100% um, sold on digital. I've got drawers full of digital cameras that go back 10 years, uh, you know, Kodak cameras, Nikon cameras, whatever, and they're very good, but there's something about the quality of medium format film in an old Rolleiflex or Hasselblad or Mamiya camera that has a totally different look, and it's the way the lens draws. Well, most of those cameras did not come with built-in flash meters. So when I'm in the studio and I want to shoot film for a special effect, I've really got to depend on the meter, uh, backed up with Polaroid, which is soon going to be gone, to get the, the look, the effect, and the exact exposure that I want to have on that film to go back and do a great scan and then a great print or a great output. Let me talk for just a second about how I shoot environmental portraits uh, outside, exterior locations, and how I use my Sekonic meter to, to nail that kind of situation. Uh, essentially, uh, I'm deeply in love with the Profoto 600B uh, flash unit, which is a battery-operated flash unit. And I love coupling that with a like a 60-inch umbrella with layers of diffusion. When I go out on location, I want to shoot something in the Texas sun, the first thing I have to do is establish the correct exposure uh, for the ambient light. And I like my ambient light a little heavy if I'm going to do uh, a setup that's going to be filled with my flash. So the first thing I do is look for the top um, shutter speed that I can sync with flash. On my D3, that's going to be something like uh, 250th of a second, but on my uh, Mamiya camera it might be 125th of a second. Um, on my Rolly camera it's 500th of a second. So I whip out my Sekonic meter. It's a zoom meter. It's, it's probably the best meter I've ever used. Um, I've used other meters and always come back to the Sekonic stuff. I use the incident light dome and I get a general reading by holding the fla uh, flash meter and aiming it back toward the camera and using it in its incident light mode in ambient light meter metering mode. And that gives me a base exposure that's going to set the floor for everything else. Then I switch the meter over to read flash, and I turn on the 600B, and I position the umbrella and the stand where I want them. And the next thing I do is take a flash meter reading, uh, measuring the output of the flash. Now, one disconnection is that it, when I shoot outside, I want to control all the light that's hitting the subject. So the next thing that I do is put up a black scrim over the top of the subject. That way, I'm cutting out about two stops of daylight. I'm just getting fill from the, uh, the light that's coming in from the sides and not from the top. So I've got my Sekonic meter out and I meter the flash exposure that I'm getting from the 600B, and then I figure out if I need to go up or down on the power of the flash so that I can get into the ballpark of my original ambient exposure. Once I've nailed that starting exposure, I write it on the piece of white gaffer's tape with a Sharpie. That way I don't forget. Uh, then when I make my second exposure meter, uh, metering for flash, uh, and I've nailed that down and I get it where I want it, I write that down on the piece of gaffer's tape. I do this because when the client walks in and the marketing director walks in and everybody's antsy to get moving, I don't want to get so rushed that I forget what the exposures are. This gives me a constant reference so that I can uh, go back to my camera, double check, go back to my lights, double check, and have a certainty that that's the uh, exposure that I want to work with. Now, light sometimes changes while you're shooting, so I hand my assistant a second Sekonic meter. Uh, we constantly check the meters to make sure they're pretty close to each other, and he'll stand over to the side in the ambient light and have the meter on, constantly taking ambient light readings, just to make sure that if the sun goes behind a cloud, if something shifts, if something changes, that I'm aware of that. And that's, that's a vital part of shooting. So, Probably from what you're hearing is that I never use the camera off manual exposure because I trust my, my handheld Sekonic meters a lot more than I trust the evaluative metering or the spot metering that's in the camera bodies themselves.
I'd like to make a point about the histograms. You know, there's there's a pervasive myth uh, among photographers nowadays that because they have the little histograms on the back of the camera, that somehow they have uh, all the information they may need to do a great exposure. And the reality is that so much of the way a reflected exposure meter, as opposed to an incident exposure meter, works, it makes it more an art and much less of a science to meter that way. Whereas with an incident light meter, like my Sikonic meter, if I go and measure from the actual subject position, I'm measuring the light that's actually falling on the subject. And it's relatively constant, and it's not, it's not influenced by weird little reflections and weird little specular highlights. So I've got an absolute measure that I'm working with. And why is that important? It's important because when I shoot a couple of hundred shots and I go back into the studio to finish out those or make raw conversions, my incident light meter gives me an incredible amount of consistency. So I can batch process things knowing that as long as I've metered them with my incident light meter, I'm in the ballpark. I'm not just in the ballpark, I'm zoned right in. If I'm shooting them with a, uh, an evaluative meter or a spot meter in one of the current top of the line uh, cameras using a reflectance meter, I could be all over the map, depending on where that meter's pointed. Bow, bow.